Good morning. Thank you all for coming out this morning and setting your alarms and joining us at our business breakfast. My name is Lisa Egan and I'm the Executive Director of the Reading North Reading Chamber of Commerce. It's my pleasure to host you here at Meadowbrook to talk about the so-called grand bargain legislation that was recently passed at the State House. I'd like to thank Meadowbrook for hosting us. They are a lovely private 18-hole golf course and if anyone would like to take a tour afterwards, um, that absolutely can be arranged. I'd like to take a moment to welcome our panel of guest and expert speakers. First, we have Chris Carlosi, the State Director of the National Federation of Independent Businesses, which is also known as NFIB. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Prior to being named State Director, he spent nine years as the NFIB Grassroots Manager working with small business owners in Massachusetts and other five New England states, and he learned firsthand from business owners the issues directly impacting their business. Next, we have Brian Kearney from the Retailers Association of Massachusetts. He's their general counsel. Um, it's also known as RAM. He joined RAM in 2011 as general counsel for the association. As a member of the Massachusetts Bar and registered Massachusetts lobbyist, Ryan is responsible for advocating on behalf of all RAM members before levels of state government as well as ensuring association compliance with the state statutory and regulatory requirements. Thanks for the coffee. Perfect. Um, Pat Lee. Our local business owner um, of the Horseshoe Grill, beloved by cornbread lovers all over New England. Um, but as we know, they do a lot more than just cornbread. And uh, welcome. He's been a past president of the chamber, a great mentor, and a person for advice for me in my four years as the director. So thank you, Pat. He also serves as the distinguished chair of the Massachusetts Restaurant Association for the past two years. And fun fact, the Horseshoe Grill is a fourth generation restaurant and has been in business for 92 years, which is amazing. So love that kind of um, success. He's on the board of the YMCA and is, he also works with St. Teresa's, Teresa's Parish Council in North Reading, as well as their Economic Development Committee. And in the past, in his spare time, which he managed to find, he hosts the Jimmy Fun Golf Tournament for the past 33 years and to date has helped raise over $750,000 to fight cancer. So, thanks for all you have the video. That's the way I wrote it. I know. <laughs> He's blushing. We're blushing together. Um, and then I also wanted to acknowledge Catherine Barton Rosetti, who actually just had to step out. Um, but she's been, she served on the chamber board for years, and she has opened two local um, successful law firms and has had a practice in Reading for many years, decades actually, and has recently joined um, a Boston-based firm called Rupert Israel & Weiner. They're an amazing, um, fully functioning, uh, with many facets, law firm in Boston, and they've also provided a moderator for us. But I wanted to acknowledge Catherine, even though she had to step out, because her husband and she uh, have worked together to help advocate for our local businesses for decades, advocating for a single lower tax rate for our local businesses, which is essential to their livelihood, and you know is very much uh, up for up for debate every year within the selectmen. And I know our our Reading businesses owe a real debt of gratitude, so I wanted to acknowledge her, even though she had to step out. They've done a lot for our community. Um, and even though she's now at a Boston-based firm, she still maintains her local practice. And they have all sorts of cool um, uh, areas within the law. And fun fact, she invited me to the uh, Boston Magazine Award winners. They have a hospitality group, so that was like, yay, thank you. That was a fun <laughs> perk when uh, we were featured in Boston Magazine together. That's never going to happen again, so I want to <laughs> So, and now, I, I, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dave Robinson, Esquire, also from Rupert, Israel, and Weiner, our panel moderator. Roberto. 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 Mm -hmm. Pardon me. Mike's retired, so it's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> All good. He focuses his practice on employment law and advises employers and employee on, excuse me, employee policies on discipline, wage, and hour compliance investigation of harassment and discrimination complaints, non-compete agreements, and various other topics. He also assists clients with government audits and employment practices. Dave regularly speaks at chamber events. Unfortunately, he's in the South Shore because otherwise he'd love to join our group. I already was like, in talking to him, I could tell he really understood how chambers work and supporting small businesses, but he gets a shout out for getting up at 5.30 to get here prior to Boston traffic to be with us today. So thank you for that. 
Um, and before we dive in, I realize that the legislation passed via the so-called grand bargain is going to affect a lot of businesses and every employer in the state. And I realize many of us may not be particularly fans of every change that happens. But to ensure a productive and informative meeting, I just wanted to say we're going to take a minute to talk about how we got here, what happened, but then really get focused on what we all need to do to comply with the new legislation. So if we get off topic or perhaps into an unproductive discussion, we will redirect just to make sure we're making the most of your precious morning and time in order to leave here with a lot of good um, tools and education um, under your belt in, ter in terms of this um, change. So I just wanted to mention that and um, I'd like to again thank our panel of experts and I will turn it over to Dave. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. Thank, Good morning. You. thank you, everyone, for showing up today. I know it's hard to come to hear bad news first thing in the morning. And, uh, and I know being an employment lawyer for now for uh, 15 years, at least, uh, Massachusetts is a very challenging place to be an employer. They like to race to the bottom, I call it, with California and New York as the most difficult place to have employees. And, uh, but I think it's, it's good that you're all here because, because the worst thing is, is not knowing that you're tripping over the law because ignorance is not a defense. So thank you all for coming. I want to thank the panelists for coming here first thing in the morning to come talk about this, this issue because I think the grand bargain is important. Um, there are a lot of... Uh, it's interesting because my, my mentor in, in litigation, because I started off in litigation in my practice, he said a good compromise was when both sides left the table unhappy. And I think that's why this is called the grand bargain, because there's nobody happy at the end of this one. So, so uh, but I, I want to reiterate Lisa's comments. I think through this, they have a great presentation for you to, 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 to do here. And we want to encourage questions, but I want the questions, I'd like the questions to be focused more on what can we do to comply rather than how we got here, because I don't want this to devolve into, a, into basically complaining about the law, because that's not going to be productive, and it's not going to help you and your businesses going forward. So let's focus on what we can do going forward rather than how we got here today. Now before I kick the, turn this off, turn this over to Chris Ryan and Pat, uh, by show of hands, how many people here own retail businesses or work for a retail business? Oh, fair number. Restaurants? Are there any restaurants in, the, in here besides Pat? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, professionals? Oh, quite a few. And how about other, other types of businesses? Other? other. Um, are there any members of the media here today? Oh, yeah. <laughs> one RTTV. member. Okay, and how about, uh, any, are there any elected officials? We had two select men who are RSVP who aren't here yet. Okay, so they may come in. Yes. Okay. Now, by show of hands, how many people here have over 50 employees? Oh, one, two. Okay, so a few. Uh, over 25. Okay. Under 25. Under seven. Okay. Great. Um, so that's just helpful for them to focus their presentation on because the, the number of employees are usually what gear some of these statutes, not all of them. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to my panelists and I'll jump in at, for legal support throughout the presentation. Well, thank you all for coming out here today. This is important information. Um, we'll, we'll try to cut some of the editorial comments out of it and move through this as quickly as possible so you can get the, the uh, information. We want to thank Lisa for uh, moving our slides forward and keeping us on track here. So without further ado, the grand bargain. And feel free to look at the screen and not look at my face. Thank you. Um, we'll be the voice in the back of the room, but so that you can see it. And we'll have a handout for some of the basic information after. But to briefly tell you how we got here, uh, because that is somewhat important. In 2014, there's a group called Raise Up Mass. They sponsored the ballot question on paid sick leave. You're all very aware of it. Uh, paid sick leave for uh, employers with 11 or more, 40 hours, fewer than 11 unpaid leave. They were successful in their attempt and kind of emboldened. They were also the same group that was pushing for a $15 minimum wage at the time and we ended up at an $11 minimum wage that was done through the legislature. 2018, they came back with a few more ballot questions. Um, and that first one is for uh, paid family medical leave, the second one is for uh, minimum wage, a minimum wage increase of 15 to $15. And the third one is an income tax surcharge 
uh, for incomes over a million dollars, which does impact small businesses. You might ask why. Well, if you have property, if you're selling property, if you're selling part of your business, and it's over that one million dollars, and you are a pass-through entity that files as an individual, you would be subject uh, to the income tax surcharge. Um, next slide. Oops, that's all right. So they're up at the state house. Next slide. Uh, the community groups, their faith groups, and you go to the next one. And more importantly, labor groups. And that's who's funding a lot of this effort. Uh, you can go to the next one. So Ryan's going to tell you a little bit about why RAM put another question forward. Sure. So we saw the, the question in 2014 and the three questions that were coming down the pike um, for, for this elect election cycle. And we also at the same time saw that for our members, uh, the, the legislature decided not to approve a sales tax holiday for the second year in a row, which for our uh, you know, technology sellers, our furniture sellers, some of our other, other s s folks that sell <coughs> bigger ticket items, uh, it was a big issue for them to, to, to lose that two years in a row. And it was time for us to kind of take a stand at the ballot box and kind of try to beat them at their own game. So we came up with uh, this question that would create a permanent sales tax holiday and then reduce um, the 6.25% sales tax to 5%. Uh, that piece was more to kind of keep us uh, you know, help us with the, with the online sales tax uh, issue that we've been facing, where you know places like New Hampshire and other states that don't have sales tax can sell into Massachusetts at a 6.25 percent uh, advantage over our members. So again, we, it's not it wasn't going to solve the problem, but it's going to kind of uh, mitigate the, the issue a little bit. And uh, what had happened, um, what we saw happen. Uh, next slide is the uh, income surcharge um, tax surcharge uh, um, constitutional ballot question. Um, was kicked off of the ballot by the Supreme Judicial Court after being challenged by, as you can see there, the Mass Tech Council, uh, Chris's organization, NFIB, Mass, Te Mass Taxpayers, uh, and a few other, uh, AIM is another one, Associated Industries in Massachusetts. And basically they said, you can't take two or three issues, put them into one question, and then put it against, put it up, up to the, the voters. It's, it's against the constitutional law. So basically the three questions that they came up with was, do you want to tax people over a million dollars at 4%? Do you want that money to go to transportation? Do you want to go? To, do you want that money to go to education? That practice is called log rolling, and they're basically taking something that's popular with the with the community, which is um, uh, transportation and education funding, and using it to get something that they're not necessarily a support of, which is the four percent surcharge. The, the SJC say you can't do that, and in turn, you create what would have raised two billion dollars for the legislature. Um, uh, and then offset by our our question, which would have cost them 1.2 uh, billion in um, in the revenue and sales tax, um, and you've basically just washed their theirs off, and now we're costing the legislature 1.2 billion dollars. Again, in our mind, they looked at it as this is our money that you're taking away from us. In our mind, it's well, this is the taxpayers' dollars, and you shouldn't be coming after it unless you need it. Um, so basically, they they you know got scared and came to us and said, okay, you know, we want to get all these questions off the ballot, and that's where the that's what led to the grand bargain negotiation. Go to the next, next slide. So the grand bargain negotiations, they feared the loss in revenue, uh, paid family medical leave, $15 minimum wage, and the sales tax question were all on the table. Income tax surcharge uh, was pending bef before the Supreme Judicial Court at the time. Things started moving quickly, though, on June 18th, the Supreme Judicial Court, as Ryan said, kicked the question off the ballot, said it was unconstitutional because of log rolling. Immediately after that, the retailers agreed to pull their question on the sales tax. Raise Up agreed to pull their question on paid family medical leave because they knew something was coming out of it in legislation. And then shortly after, on June 20th, a bill came forward uh, on the, the so-called Grand Bargain Bill, House Bill 4640. And it was released at about 10 a.m. that morning. By 11 o'clock, they were taking roll call votes. So it moved very quickly. Um, it passed very quickly, too. By the afternoon, it was law. Uh, well, signed into law, though, a week later by the governor on June 28th. Uh, business, the business community, the labor community sat around the table. There were a lot of ideas going back and forth. What came out of it was the grand bargain. Um, you will see what was in it, you will see what was included, and you will see who got more of what. Uh, so moving forward, as you can see, all the legislators, the governor signing this thing, but as David said earlier, who was not there? The business community was not there, the labor community. They were not happy with everything that was in it. We'll leave you to decide um, who got more. We'll tell you about a little more. You can see uh, Senator Jason Lewis, who you know prides himself with being one of the architects of this, with Representative Broder. 
Uh, those were the two who kind of led the charge there. And of course, the governor signing it into law. Everyone's smiling, everyone happy. I don't think we will be by the end of this, though. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can go forward one more. <coughs> so minimum wage paid family medical leave sales tax reduction. That's what we're going over right now. Uh, next slide. So we're going to tell you where we were with the grand bargain, where we ended up. So under the ballot question, in 2019, we were supposed to jump a dollar in the minimum wage from the current $11 to $12 in 2019. This is all January 1st. These are slated to go up. 2020, it jumps to 13. 2021, it goes to 14. In 2022, it taps out at $15 an hour. And then in 2023, it's indexed to inflation. The current minimum wage, as you probably all know, is $11 an hour. Uh, you can go forward one. So what happened under the grand bargain? In 2019, it still goes up to 12 bucks. In 2020, it goes to 12.75. 2021, 13.50. 2022, now 14.25. It doesn't hit 15 dollars till 2023. Uh, and there is no indexing. We removed that, and that is now gone from any legislation that passed. Uh, that's important because at 15 dollars an hour, indexing starts to add up. Next, we're going to go over the tip wage in the next slide. And uh, we're going to let our, our restaurant expert tell us a little bit about that. But uh, just to let you know where it was in the in the ballot question in 2019, it was slated to go from the current 375 to 505, then in 2020 to 635, then in 2021 to 765, and it was going to top out at 2022 uh, in 2022 to $9 an hour, and then index to inflation afterwards. So okay, um, by a show of hands. Who here knows what tip wage is? Okay, we'll say have to, so I'll just take a moment, take a background uh, approach to it. Tip wage is the wage that is paid the uh, hourly to the employees that are earning gratuities on the floor. And so that wage is balanced against a tax tip credit. We won't go down that road right now, but with that being said, it's allowed to be lower than the minimum wage. Those people, if they do not earn, say a server does not earn the minimum wage, it's up to the employer to make good on that so that they earn their minimum wage. But <clears throat> this tipped wage is extremely important to our industry because of the number of hours their servers are working each and every day in each and every restaurant. So it was a very uh, important fight for us to, to wage to make sure that this stayed under control. Um, and without, we'll spend more time what happens if that tipped wage goes away, but that's basically what that tipped wage is, okay? Uh, does not include the gratuities that they earn, but just that hourly wage. So from the chart on the left, it shows what was proposed and then through the grand bargain on the right hand side, um, what it ended up being, uh, final number being 675 in 2023. And now we can throw that up against the minimum wage. So the, the original rule, I believe, was 60% of the minimum wage, $9. And if you go to 675, you were able to negotiate it down to 45%. And we're at currently 34.89%. I think 45 is the average across the country. Right. And, and just for a little perspective, in the state of Maine, they, they did away with it. They reduced the, or, or did away with the tip credit. Servers ended up flooding the state house. It was done through a referendum, and they had to, through the legislature, reinstate it because so many servers saw a reduction in the pay because people thought you're making more, we're going to tip less. Uh, so we'll see if that same thing happens in Massachusetts. Uh, while the tip weight was not removed entirely, it's still a significant increase. Yeah, I mean, for, for a practical reality, most servers could care less about their, their, their wages. That's basically, at the end of the day, most good servers aren't even getting a paycheck because it's all going to withholdings anyways. So the idea for increasing the minimum wage for them is, is, a, is really, a, it doesn't even move the needle because at the end of the day, they make their money through tips. Yeah, they were trying to account for you know, bad actors that are kind of you know, not necessarily making, you know, every, every restaurant that I've talked to, um, you know, if they if they know that someone's not getting that minimum wage, that they're they're not going to you know continue to work there. They're going to you know they can take a walk. Um, there's but it, it seems more like in the immigrant community. So they're trying to solve for a problem uh, that impacts a small amount of the community. But again, they're represented by labor and they're represented by community groups 
um, so you know they get they get hurt. <coughs> All right, if we can move on to the next uh, slide. So premium Sunday holiday pay, I'll let Ryan tell you a little more about this. There was nothing in the ballot question dealing with time and a half Sunday holiday pay. So this issue is always brought up anytime um, the minimum wage discussion is brought up. Again, this was originally when we were, it was a trade-off to get relief from the blue laws to allow our retail stores in Massachusetts to open on Sunday. Massachusetts and Rhode Island are the only two states that require this. There's no other industry in Massachusetts or Rhode Island that requires it. It's only retail. And basically what it says is if you have workers that, that perform work on Sunday and six um, designated holidays, you have to pay them time and a half of their regular rate of pay uh, for those hours. Um, as you can imagine, in the 80s, uh, when this relief came through, uh, the minimum wage was much lower. Now we're at a point where you're talking about a $15 minimum wage and a starting wage of $22.50. Uh, for someone bagging groceries, we're across the border in New Hampshire, that minimum wage is $7.25. So you can see where there's that competitive uh, disadvantage. So what we were able to do as part of the minimum wage negotiation was to uh, create a repeal. This was actually their uh, model. Our model was to allow anybody that's already receiving it to continue to receive it. And then anybody that comes on new that basically come on to drop all the expectation of time and a half pay um, wouldn't get it, and that would be the fairest way to do it. Uh, they chose this way, and then basically blew us up during the debate and, and media, news media saying that we were taking away workers' rights. Um, so what you basically see is um, instead of each year it's going to the multiplier is going to go from 1.5 in 2019 to 1.4, and then down um, incrementally until it gets to 2023 when the multiplier will be straight time. Um, yeah, so, so issues go with the interaction between that and uh, overtime payment, which I guess we can talk about later. Um, and then I guess we can go to the next slide. <laughs> That's okay, so. only for um, employers that have seven that or correct. more, correct? Excuse me, I was remiss in, in mentioning that. Yes, so you, you seven, seven employees uh, in a store anytime during the week, um, including the owner proprietor. So seven. anytime during the week. If I have seven people on my payroll, including myself, then I pay time and a half. That's correct. Okay. In 2023, you won't, though. Uh, <laughs> if we're still around. If you're still around. <laughs> we'll hold up our fingers for you. So pay, paid family medical leave, we'll, we'll have time for questions at the end on minimum wage. So moving on, um, this is a new benefit. It is paid job protected leave. And the reason you can use it for receiving treatment for a serious medical condition, that's for you. Uh, bond with a newborn or newly adopted child, care for a family member with serious medical condition, care for a family member injured while serving in the armed forces, and handle matters arising from a family member's active duty in the armed forces or call for deployment. Um, so those are the reasons you could use this type of leave. I think we need to go back one. Yeah. Sorry. Or, oh, I'm um, sorry, head two. Sorry. To <coughs> So paid family medical leave, under the ballot question, duration, how long? 16 weeks of family leave, 26 weeks of medical leave, and 26 weeks aggregate, and also military leave. Now for NFIB, our average member is about five employees. So that's 20% of your workforce out for up to 26 weeks, which is a sizable uh, you know, amount of time and, and can certainly have an impact on the workplace. It did change under the grand bargain. 12 weeks of family leave, 20 weeks of medical leave, 26 weeks aggregate. So they can use, in a benefit year, up to 26 weeks of leave. Also, that, and, and the reason is that military leave state had 26 weeks. So it, it is still a pretty big chunk of time, and not much change there, a couple weeks difference, uh, and that's where they ended up under the grand bargain. If we go forward a slide. Wage replacement. Uh, under the ballot question, it was 90% of an employee's weekly wage up to a cap. The cap was $1,000. Under the grant bargain, that changed. And it's a little more complex. 80% of an employee's wage is up to 50% of the state average weekly wage, which is about $669. Then over that amount, 50% uh, of wages <coughs> exceeding 50% of the state average weekly wage up to the cap. So, that is so lower income workers could have a higher wage replacement rate, and then it starts to slow as you get over that average weekly wage. And then the cap was changed, we can just go forward one more, uh, to $850 from $1,000. I'll tell you that during the negotiations, 
it was turning out that employees would be making more money to stay home because of what was taxable and what was not. So due to the way the contributions fall, they would be making more money to stay home because a certain amount was not taxable. That changed under this grant bargain legislation for the integrity of the program. Uh, so that people weren't staying home making more money and they were incentivized to go back into the workplace. Yes? I was just wondering, what's the number of employees that this affects and what size business? This is for all businesses right now. Okay. All businesses of any size. Uh, so let me go now on the contribution. Now this is where that, that uh, number does change a little. Uh, for contributions, payroll tax of 0.63% of the employee's annual wages, and it's adjusted annually, or can be adjusted annually. Uh, employers cover 50% of the premium, so that means 0.313% uh, percent of the annual wages. There is no small business exemption. Um, this is all under the ballot question. There is no opt-out. So there were some changes made to the final legislative package. If we can go forward uh, one. So it's still a payroll tax of 0.3%, of 0.63% adjusted annually. Employees cover 100% of their family leave and 40% of their medical leave contribution. Employers cover at least 60% for the medical leave. Employee, this is where it's a little more complex and it goes to the number question that you just asked. Employers with fewer than 25 employees are not required to cover the employer portion uh, of the contribution, but are required to remit the employee portion. So if you have fewer than 25 workers, you do not have to make that employer contribution into the fund. You certainly can if you opt to, um, but you do not have to. The other thing uh, worth mentioning here is that the leave was separated because an employer could and we'll get to this in the next slide, actually. Actually, let's go forward one slide before I cover that. Uh, under the 2018 ballot question, there was no opt-out. However, businesses have the option to provide a private benefit program as long as it meets the requirement of the law. That means duration, uh, wage replacement, everything has to be equal to or greater than the law. Uh, the private plan must be certified by the state, so you submit it to the uh, state and they will approve your plan. And the reason I brought this up, because you have the right as a business to opt out of either medical or opt out of family, you can do either or or both to offer that private plan. So you can either pay into the state plan, and I'll say here that the state plan is very similar to workers' comp or UI, where you're paying into it, you don't do anything with the benefit, the state is gonna oversee all the paperwork, all the payouts, uh, you just remit the employee contribution and pay your contribution if you're a business of 25 or more. Uh, some businesses may opt to find a private plan. Uh, we think there may be more private plan offered at the time, uh, but others may decide to just go with this uh, state-run uh, plan, or uh, the, I can't remember what the name of it's called, the uh, Paid Family Trust Fund or something similar to that, but you're gonna, uh, they're gonna manage the benefit essentially. So if we can move on. Independent contractor self-employed. Under the grand bargain for some reason, I mean under the uh, ballot question for some reason, contracting with a self-employed individual required a contribution of half the required wage percentage for regular employees. For, for some reason you had to pay in for independent contractors. It made very little sense because an independent contractor, you're not offering them any other benefits. Uh, under the grand bargain this changed a bit. So a truly self-employed individual must opt in and 100% of the premiums are paid by that self-employed individual. Now there is a little bit of a rub to this, if we go forward one. If, oh, sorry. if you are a Massachusetts employer and your workforce is made up of greater than 50% of independent contractors, that employer shall be treated the same as other businesses of the same size. So that means if you're one of these 25 or more and you have half your workforce as independent contractors, you will be required to do the employer contribution. Um, some of that still has not been determined as to how to count the independent contractors. That is something, and we will probably have this answer quite a few times, that will need to be done through the regulatory process. So there, there will be some you know, uh, fine tuning of this going forward, but as it stands now, the way that it is written, if you are truly a self-employed out there by yourself, it's on you for this benefit. If you're a business and you're mostly having independent contractors work for you when you're 25 or more, you will have that employer contribution. 
Chris, can I jump in on this? Absolutely. One of the things that I, you should keep in mind, too, though, is in Massachusetts, they have a very strict law on, on independent contractors. And basically, it's a three-part test that the employer has to prove all three in order to be an, an, an independent contractor. So I would suggest that if anyone here has 50% of their workforce as independent contractors, they probably should talk to an employment lawyer immediately. Because chances are those are not independent contractors and they, and they are in fact employees, both under this statute, under the wage statute, under unemployment, and possibly even workers' comp. So keep that in mind. That that's that I, I'm not sure why they were fighting over that all that much given the, the standard that applies in Massachusetts. Unfortunately, you're absolutely right. We have one of the most onerous independent contractor laws, if not the most. It's the, the most. I've and looked at every. It is. In the, it's by far the most. The cost of misclassifying a, 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 an employee. It should, I mean, you're going to run into wage issues. You're going to run into you know penalties for health insurance, workers' comp, unemployment, all that stuff. So it's just it's a nightmare. So I mean, we we got to the point where you know we've been fighting on the independent contractor law for quite some time, trying to get it fixed, and it's only, it's to the point where we kind of. In general, advise our members not to try to use independent contractors because it's 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 that too much. For us. And, and, as I don't know if I'm the only CPA in this room, but as a CPA, I would encourage any business owner don't rely on your CPA. This is a legal question, yeah. not a tax question. Right. Plus, and you need to talk to these people here who have a legal degree. Yeah. That's the legal answer you need to have. Well, to jump on that as well, your CPA may very accurately tell you that, that, that under the tax code, a person is an independent contractor. That's because the, 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 the DOR in Massachusetts follows the IRS regulation. That is not the same definition for, for wages and other things. So you have to be, so the CPA may tell you quite accurately, no, there's no tax liability for this employee, because this person, because they're, they're properly classified as an independent contractor. Probably shouldn't be telling you that because that's legal advice and that should be reserved to an attorney. But the point is that doesn't end the question because other statutes have a different definition in Massachusetts. The tax statute follows the NAT, the IRS, which is more liberal. But for everything else, it's, it's under the Mass statute. So the CPA Basically. can tell you what to do after they tell the CPA what the answer is. Exactly. Thank you. All right. All right. If we could move on to the next slide. So. Implementation. This was originally all going into effect a few months from now, January 1st, 2019. But that fortunately changed. So we can work on some things behind the scenes as well as work on the regulations to try to fine tune some of these things that are out there that are, you still have questions on. This is job protected leave. You bring someone in uh, to as a replacement worker in, in that time frame and then you get rid of them. Uh, is that going to impact your experience rating under UI? It might. It's not supposed to. But these are things that need So implementation has changed. On the family leave component, uh, for care of a child, that goes into effect January 1st, 2021. For family members with serious health conditions, to take care of them, uh, that's July 1st, 2021. Uh, next. Medical leave, 1-1-21. Military family leave, 1-1-21. But here's the funny part. Contributions to the fund have to start on 7-1-2019. The fund has to be solvent. So that means money from the employers will start going forward, but most importantly, money will be coming out of the paychecks of employees on 7119 for benefit they can't use for almost a year and a half. Uh, so they may be scratching their heads as to what that deduction's gonna be, and you'll have to explain to them, well, that's going into a state run fund so that you can have this new benefit to use uh, family and medical leave when it becomes available. Well, I'm oh, sorry, you can jump in. So one thing too is you also have a notification requirement. As most new Massachusetts statutes for employment law is, there's a requirement to notify your employees. So so that would kick in arguably under the statute as of one 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 nineteen. So you probably so your best bet is that that's how you start explaining to the employees that this is coming. In that way, and you'll know as of July first, you're going to have deductions taken out of your wages and. If you don't notify your employee, there's issues. I won't go into it, but just just notify your employees of this by 1-1-19. Yeah, my only comment on this, I mean, so the, the agency gets set up in January, and then they have six months to basically set up this agency, set up a regulatory structure, which includes a process for you, if you wanted to use an opt-out, to you know approve your whatever your plan is. 
I can't see, I've never seen a, a regular, you know, an agency set up, an agency set up, and a process for approval of, of opt-out type of, of, that type of mechanism in, in, in a six month period. So I don't necessarily know how they're going to be able to do that. Um, the other issue is, so you start contributions on um, 7119. Um, the fund is supposed to, supposed to be funded at 140% of, of what they say it's gonna cost to, to cover these, these leaves. You're not gonna get that in the period from 720, 7119, um, oh, maybe you will. Um, yeah, they didn't give you enough time. They did change it, yeah. excuse me, I'll scratch that, I stand corrected. You can but, cut it close. Yeah, again, I mean, they're, they're, it just, the, the whole thing wasn't very well thought out, but I think the opt-out piece is probably the, the, the biggest thing. If you have a, a plan now that you think would cover this, you may not be able to continue using that, and you may have to start making these con contributions if that agency doesn't get their act together and, and have an approval process, and I, again, in my experience, they, they will not. They are slow at that sort of thing. Uh, yes? We're talking about people who, make, who do like 10 hours a week, we're talking about full time. Uh, time doesn't matter. Anybody. Any, anybody. any employee part time. Everyone. The panel no exam. No exam. Can I just jump in with a few other thoughts on, uh, on the paid leave before we jump to sales tax? Mm -hmm. um, from a lawyer looking at the statute, I actually looked at it this morning again just to look at it. But the interesting thing that I think is that the legislature passed <coughs> the most protected form of of leave anti-retaliation provision out of any provision that they've ever passed. <coughs> so for instance, in discrimination, if somebody complains about discrimination and you fire them, that's retaliation. And that and they would then be entitled to recover their lost wages and attorney's fees. In this case, a court may, doesn't say shall, which is interesting because that, that means it's permissive, not required, but but a court may order triple wages for for any type of violation of a retaliation against an employee, meaning any type of demotion, firing, failure to promote. It also could order attorney's fees, injunction, require you to bring them back to work. But the most interesting part about the statute that I think everybody needs to keep in mind starting now is the statute shifts the burden. If you do anything to an employee who goes on leave for six months, there's a presumption that it was retaliatory. So that means, Anybody that's using intermittent leave, six months every time they use their leave, they're covered. So somebody who has a weekly thing they have to deal with for an hour a week, they're basically perpetually for the rest of their career and now have a presumption anytime you do something to them that, that, that is presumptive that, that it was retaliatory. And what they further said is you have to, as, you, you now have the burden to prove it wasn't retaliatory. Normally the employee has to prove it was. And even more so, they've raised your burden to clear and convincing evidence, which is basically a step below beyond any reasonable doubt, which is a criminal standpoint. So basically, as an employer now, when I get a call from an employer saying, I was about to fire this employee, but now he's, he's gotten wind of it, and now he's taking leave, can I fire him? I would have to probably advise you not to. So it's, unless you have really, really strong evidence to show that this employee should be terminated. So that's the biggest takeaway from paid leave, the paid family medical leave that I think everyone's kind of ignoring is this anti-retaliation provision, which, which basically makes it the most draconian in all of the statutes in Massachusetts. I guess we talked about it earlier, I mean, the best defense, I guess, would be to make sure you document everything, which is best Absolutely. practice anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but it, even more so now, you need to document everything. You, I mean, it's, it'll make it easier for, for a gentleman like, like David to go into a courtroom and say, look, I have months of you know, citations and, and bad, you know, bad personnel file um, entries. This is why they were fired, not because of them taking leave. Uh, you don't have that, and you're just kind of doing it. He said, she, she said, you're, 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 you're going to trouble. Lose. You're going to lose in that case if you don't. And documentation is a minimum, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I think, hopefully, the regulations will provide some guidance as to what is and what isn't retaliatory, because it's going to be a problem. Is this is sort of, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's OK. You can go first. I have a question. Does this take away our at-will employment status in Massachusetts, or do they still kind of have that there, but we really don't? Uh, yeah, I would say that Massachusetts has long since been, you had it there, but you don't. Because basically, do anything, you can terminate someone for any reason except for discrimination, retaliation, um, any type of wage like thing issue. There are lots of exceptions to the at-will employment, and so I typically tell employers, don't rely on that when you're firing someone. Have a reason 
and have documentation to back it up. And, and if you haven't been documenting your employment, your employees' be infractions and are just relying on the at will, I would strongly caution everyone to stop doing that and start documenting all the issues and sitting down with your employee, showing them the documentation, put it in their file. Because then when you fire them, you have a, a big, long history now to back it up. So you, it'll make it much easier to win any claim, much less a claim under the Paid and Family Leave Act retaliation. Yeah, we kind of tell our members on any issue to kind of use a three, three strikes rule. So if, it's, if they're continuously late, you tell them, you document it, you give them written notification, you have them sign on it, that's two. And then you give them a third warning saying this happens again, you get fired. So you have this, there's three points there. So you can do that for everything that they, they do. If, it, if they're you know stealing from you or whatever it is, you can just document all that. <laughs> everything you steal again. No, 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 no. Stealing, you can terminate them. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. You're but famous. You, yeah. I mean, again, you need to, I mean, from, you know, we have a loss prevention committee. We talk about it all the time that, you know, even if you have, you know, the number one source of shrink is internal theft. And we still have members that can't seem to be able to fire people without getting hit with some sort of counter claim. So sure. it's, it's, um, it's tough. So do we have I, Yeah, I'm a little concerned that I are confused by the, the uh, contribution. You're saying that the contribution to the employer's piece is the 0.63 percent. So the, the so the contribution is it, for, the, for the for each employee is 0.63 percent of their payroll. Okay, so it's total payroll for the employer is, is 0.63. What portion is the employee pay? So the the employee pays 100 percent of the family leave, and then 40 percent of the medical leave. That equals out to about 50-50. But the reason it was set up that way was so that if you wanted to opt out, you can continue to let the employee pay into that 100% for the um, family leave, and then you could buy a cheaper plan. Well, uh, not, might not be cheaper, but you could, you, yeah, it, it would be cheaper than if you bought a medical and family leave plan privately. So, so what is the cost? If you've got a notification of the employee that you're going to start withholding pay from his paycheck, for this medical leave plan, what is that cost to you? It's it's roughly going to be half of 0.63 percent to you. That's what it equals out to. Even if you do oh, it at 100 percent and 40 percent, this will all that all those schedules I believe will all be part of the regulatory structure. So they have, to, I mean they they can go. They're at 0.63, but every year they're going to go up, and they'll you'll receive note. It's kind of like UI. They'll give you your notification of this is what your tax uh, responsibility mm -hmm. liability is going to be. I mean, that's how I envision it. But right now, yeah, I can't yeah, go I beyond the 0.63%. Now, somewhere I've heard that there is a chargeback procedure that allows the chargeback to, to the employee down the road. I've not heard anything on that. Can you, can you elaborate? I'm sorry, I'm not following. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand okay. it enough. That's why I was raising the question. Um, but I understood that, that at some point there is a chargeback to the employee for leave taken. I don't know how that works. So. Not that I know of, no. All right. Okay. And, and sorry, you had a question? Yeah, I, I just, no, I'm forgetting because it was a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what I'm, I think what I was questioning is, is when, when you were talking about start documenting now because if, if they're going through family medical leave, if they start taking leave now, something, I think that's the conversation no, that we no, were No, what I'm saying is, is if you have disciplinary concerns with an employee, don't wait. You should have a process, a practice mm -hmm. now where mm -hmm. every employee does something that you find is wrong that you ultimately would terminate them for. You should document it as you go because you need to build a record before you fire someone. So the point is you want to have this practice well in place by the time these things go into effect in 2021 because you don't want it to appear like you're simply documenting to fire someone who's on leave. And it would, the same thing, it, uh, would, would the same thing apply if you have people that are part-time workers? Yes. And instead of, like, say for several months you have them on it, like, you know, 20 hours a week, but now all of a sudden you're reducing hours or whatever, whatever, and you have reduced them because they're just not an effective employee, so you just give them four hours a week. Can they still come back at you for... Sure. You know, if they out? were taking leave, they could come after you for retaliation because you've affected the terms and conditions of their employment adversely. So anytime you do something that could cost them money mm -hmm. or could affect their career going forward, so you know and that's going to get the trick. The tricky part is if you start documenting instances of, of poor performance, could they make a retaliation claim even though you've not fired them at that point? 
but you, their argument would be, well, yeah, but outside the six months, you then fire me relying on these bad behaviors that are untrue during the six month period. So there's gonna be all sorts of permutations. I can't even begin to think about what plaintiff's attorneys are gonna do with this, but I expect that there's gonna be a cottage industry just dealing with these types of claims. So, but, but I definitely think you need to document it. To sum it up, basically, the law is giving the employee an extra nat of protection from you retaliating against them for using leave. If you don't have documentation saying that the reason I brought them down to four hours was right. X, Y, Z, to be able to hand over to him to defend you in court, you're, you're gonna lose that case. Okay, but if they don't want to take, I mean, uh, I mean, family leave is, I, 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 well, anyway, now I'll have to recollect my thoughts because I'm, I'm still finding all of this. If, if people want to take time off for sick leave, for example, is that going to fall under this idea of family medical leave? If I have someone right now that has the flu every three months and they take a week off, I mean, am I still going to? Well, it has to be a serious that. medical condition. Yeah. Um, you know, if it's just like sick leave, like the guaranteed yeah, sick leave that they have now, right. plus you have to use, you know, any leave before that, um, before you, and it's a seven day process before you can, um, you know, use, utilize the, the family or medical leave. So it's not for things like that. It's not for like the flu or, or you know, short term incidents. And it's all, it, 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 and it can't be a work related accident or anything it's going to be non-work related uh, so it's like cancer it's the more serious okay medical condition. but you but my recommendation is if, you, if you're concerned about it you should talk to a lawyer because the right. serious medical condition in Massachusetts has been very liberally defined <laughs> <All right. laughs> I, I wouldn't just say it's cancer it's there's yeah. a way wide gradation from there it's basically if you're receiving continuous treatment from a doctor that's considered a, a serious medical condition. I mean, we, we, we saw it under the marijuana law. There's a list of, yes. of, of medical marijuana usages, like reasons you can get the license to use it, and then there's like a catch-all that says you can do it for pretty much any reason. It's been interpreted to basically allow you to go and say, I have chronic sniffles or whatever it is, well, and get it. <laughs> it hasn't even been interpreted yeah. at this point because right. it's just, they, it's just nobody's yeah. litigated it's the, the issue. Yeah. It's, been, it's the Wild West, and that's going to be the problem here. That's, it's the Wild West. You don't want to be the first employer to litigate these issues. That's, you don't want to spend $300,000 taking this all the way up to the SJC to argue that you're right and then find out you're right and then you still you don't get any recompense. Or even worse, you find out you're wrong and then you got to pay the other side's attorney's fees on top of that. So it's, that, what I'm cautioning is, is you want to build your case against an employee so that it will be unassailable when it comes time to actually terminate them. I used to think it was scary just presenting this stuff, but now that we have lawyers on the panel, it gets even more scary. Yes, um, unfortunately. So if we could just move on quickly yeah. to get to the next slide, uh, so we can very briefly, Ryan will go over that, uh, the sales it's, tax. Reduction. Yeah, so we, we, we left the sales tax where it is at 6.25, let the legislature continue to collect their money and spend it on as they will, um, but we were able to get a permanent sales tax holiday um, uh, in place, so every August there will be a, a sales tax holiday that the if I remember correctly, the DOR has to make an approval by July 1st. By July 1st, and if they don't, then the legislature, maybe the other way around. Yeah. The legislature gets to pick a date uh, in August uh, by July 1st, and if they don't, then the, the DOR steps in and just, and just uh, points the date. And that's really it for. Yeah, if you could just go on to the next slide. So, as Ryan said, guaranteed sales tax holiday. As you know, there was one this year, which was not part of this. This goes into effect for 2019. Uh, the 2018 sales tax holiday was done through the economic development bill. Uh, we can move on. So groups are out there celebrating, just to let you know, on the $15 minimum wage, the state's in red, uh, and, and that's not entirely the whole state, that's sometimes just the city, uh, have the $15 minimum wage or moving to it. Uh, we will be in the vast minority of states there. Uh, of course, labor was celebrating this as a huge victory. If you go on to the next slide. Uh, there's a lot of legislators, elected officials. I think uh, maybe your state senator, yeah, he's up there. Jason Lewis celebrating it. Um, if we could go on to the next slide, uh, some extreme reactions. My favorite was this state senator who was saying that retailers pulled in record profits and, and now they're doing away with time and a half pay. And I, I always joke with Ryan, I don't know what re big retailers they were talking about Sears, Macy's, uh, Kmart. 
uh, Toys R Us, you name it, they're you know raking in those profits. <laughs> so uh, if we can move on to the next slide. And this is what scares me most, and this is the part in comments from Race Up when they accepted the grant bargain, and I think this is important. Uh, we will continue to do this work until every worker in Massachusetts has a livable wage, family supporting benefits, and a transportation and education system that lifts people up funded by the wealthy paying their fair share. The group said in a statement, we're not willing to wait to win the gains that Massachusetts workers need. Next slide. We are only getting started. So that's what kind of scares us. This is a lot at once that you're absorbing as business owners. Uh, you are dealing with the EMAC assessment, you are dealing with high health care costs, you are dealing with high energy costs, you are still absorbing paid sick leave, and here come two more down the pike. Um, it's a lot for a business, it's these one size fits all mandates, and we have to be very aware, and as business owners, you have to let your legislators know when something like this comes up, how it impacts your business, how it hurts your business and your ability to operate, to hire, to grow, to expand. Um, that's what's scary. We're already hearing these groups are looking to do uh, maybe ballot initiatives on what we call restrictive scheduling, they call predictive scheduling. That means if you're not scheduling your employees 21, 14 days in advance, you have to pay predictability pay. Uh, we're hearing mandatory retirement accounts. So legislating through the ballot is not a good process. Uh, paid sick leave was a little document about this big when that went forward. Uh, this thing was, you know, a stack. This was dictionary sized. There's a lot of moving parts. As you can hear, there's still a lot that needs to be done with it through the regulatory process. It's, it, it doesn't lead to good legislation when you kind of have a threat like do it or else. So it's, we're going to take it to the ballot where it's posing well and, and it's going to cost millions of dollars to fight. Essentially, the business community couldn't fight paid sick leave in 2014 because it's an expensive fight. And this one, they were looking at, you know, maybe up to $10 million to fight two ballot questions, which is hard for the business community because no one wants to be out in the front on that. No one wants to be that uh, business that's targeted by union representatives and people on Twitter and Facebook uh, slamming you as a business owner because you're trying to fight for your livelihood. Uh, groups like NFIB, like the retailers, like the restaurant association, you know, we fight this thing to a degree. But without the millions of dollars behind it to fight a ballot question, it makes it very difficult. And we end up with legislation like this. So it's important, I can't stress enough, to communicate with your legislators. Let them know when something like this comes up, what it does to you. Uh, it's death by a thousand cuts for businesses in Massachusetts sometimes. I hear from my members uh, complaining about all sorts of things. And then to have new things piled on top of it makes it even more difficult. So I don't mean to, to bring the conversation down even further, but I do think it's very important to talk. You are the experts. You are the people who sign the front of the paycheck. You know what it's like to run a business better than any elected official, unless you happen to be a business owner as well. So making sure you, you know they know your opposition to these things and how it impacts you and your employees is important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, to, to sum it up, David had said at the outset that a good negotiation, you have people on both sides that are pissed. You look at this uh, package and you try to scratch your head and say, how can these labor folks actually be upset about this? Uh, they got their minimum wage, they got their paid leave program, they, you know, they got pretty much everything that they wanted. Um, again, they, you know, they said at the outset, a lot of these negotiations, we want to have the highest minimum wage in the, in, in the country. We want to have the, the high, most highly compensated and longest term uh, paid leave in the country. And the reason they want to do this is then they can take that from Massachusetts and try to replicate it in other states. And it helps them, you know, gain membership. So uh, again, they they look at this and they're already going to come back and, 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 and again, they they want to shore up paid leave. They're going to continue to try to go for a living wage. And they just got 15. And I I would guarantee you that there will be a piece of legislation filed next session saying that they want to go up to 20. It's just the way that they operate. So. Again, we're, we want to talk. We're here to talk about compliance, but uh, I have to, you know, echo Chris's uh, message that when you hear from uh, your chamber of commerce, you hear from Lisa, you hear from NFIB, or if you're members of RAM, you hear from RAM, and they ask you to activate and contact your, your lawmakers. You have to do it. I mean, we talked about how the SJC and we talked uh, decision on on the on the um, on the um, in search, uh, income surcharge was kind of a, a, a catalyst. One of the other catalysts was we got together as business groups sat down in a room at the Omni Parker House with uh, four or five legislators that are supposed to be dealing with this, and we had people tell their stories. And one of the people was in this room right now, and I think that her, her standing up and telling these legislators, this is what you did to my business, this is how, what I've had to do because of all these things you're adding up, really hit them hard. And while they didn't back off of their position, 
they were in more, they, they were kind of put more on guard and more willing to negotiate because she had to have the, the audacity to kind of stand up, stand up to them. And, and any time that you guys do that, they want to hear that story. They see me and Chris, and they see us all the time. And they look at us as kind of a cog in the wheel, but we're not, we're not their constituents. We're not the ones that are hiring their constituents. It's, it's you. So you really have to be the ones that kind of step up and, and, and talk to us. With, with like, things like this, why would Amazon or any large employer ever consider moving into Massachusetts? Well, they so because they can, they can basically that risk or that added cost that they have to pay in Massachusetts, they can spread it over the entire country. Yeah. It's not a problem for them. They're, they may be they may be losing in Massachusetts because they have to pay fifteen dollars, uh, you know, fifteen dollars to someone a bag of groceries. But in New Hampshire, they're paying seven twenty five. They're making a killing. Yeah, fifteen dollars is the problem. It's, it's all of these other kinds of again. Things. They just it's the medical leave kind of so, thing and so the lack of ability to control your workforce. Sure, on or the, getting so, people to come to work. Yeah, so again, you, you have the opt out and the paid leave. They'll buy a they'll buy a, a paid leave um, package that covers the whole country and it'll cost them you know pennies on the dollar. And, and you brought up an important point when you said you know uh, these, these programs that might not be in our state but in other states. One of the things that you did not hear mentioned was a teen or training wage. Yep. Now, 39 other states in the country have a teen or training wage. It's a percentage of the minimum wage. We brought this up. I mean, the unions pushed back so hard on this, I, I couldn't believe it. Um, it's usually 80% of the minimum wage for a period of time, maybe, uh, for, for people under 18. And of course, they bring up the sob story. Well, some teenagers are supporting households, but they, you know that's not the vast majority of teenagers. Most of them will pass that time frame for the training wage and make the full minimum wage. But a lot of kids don't have those summer jobs anymore. They're losing those soft skills sure. like you just described, how to show up on time, how to dress properly for work, um, how to behave in the work, uh, workplace. And those soft skills are going away because no one wants to pay a teenager $15 an hour to bag groceries or sweep floors or do something in a shop. Uh, but this is even having an impact on, on budgets and communities where they have certain allocations for teen jobs or, or you know, the YMCAs or the nonprofits out there too because they have to pay the $15 minimum wage. So, uh, it's a problem that was not included. That's something we're certainly going to work for moving forward. Uh, but that was one of the things that was pushed back very hard at Teen Wage, where the, where the unions were having people uh, stomping their feet and yelling through the state house. But they did it for the restaurants, then they did it on the, fifth, uh, the teen training wage, and they did it on the, the rollback of the premium pay. It was, you know, a theatrics in a time where negotiations were going on. Yes. Uh, two questions. One, is there some sort of summary for everybody in this room? We do have a handout, and it has all those talking points that you're going to need for implementation, and wage replacement, and duration. Um, so on the way out, we do have that available to you. And two, is there some sort of prediction on, on this part as the employer base shrinks in the state because of this? I can't imagine the lever expand as people start to retire or maybe think they can sell their businesses and find out they can't. At what point? Does the state realize this is going to blow up? We have one restaurant owner in the room. I think that shows you know the impact and the way that you know certain industries and main streets are. Uh, to use the retailer's term, you've seen a lot of dark storefronts on main streets. I mean, you've seen a lot of bigger guys who, who uh, you know, also going away. You know, we all end up working at Amazon at some point. That's scary. You know, some problems. Yeah, yeah. there's jobs out there. But, uh, I mean, we heard from one member that. Uh, he said, you know, in the past, I could deal with this. I could move things around every if you, if you increase the minimum wage by a couple of, you know, a quarter or two um, every four or five years. It's something I could budget for. It's something I could push around. It's when you start adding all these things on top of each other in such a quick period of time that they, you know, they, he's basically, I'm up against the wall and I can't do that anymore. So the, the next logical thing is they're going to have to either start cutting jobs, cutting hours, or, or, you know, or raising prices. And you can only raise prices so much when you have somebody in the other end selling something into the state that doesn't have to pay for all these things. Uh, as far as the sales tax issue is concerned, is Massachusetts moving towards a point where you'll be able to, uh, like other states do, even if you don't have nexus in the state, that we can still impose the sales tax on those other places? Yeah, so I don't see how they don't do it. So our Department of Revenue passed um, uh, a regulation last year uh, that basically said if you have half a million dollars in sales and over, I think it's, I want to say, 500 transactions, um, it's a relative 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 relative. Relative. Um, you would then have enough, you basically have a nexus um, in the state. There was a, a Supreme Court decision that, that in um, South Dakota that came down and basically flipped the Quill decision which said you could not tax unless you have a nexus. 
on its head, basically overruled so that's not the case anymore, and implemented a new kind of economic nexus test. But if you look at what's, uh, you know, the thresholds that South Dakota has, there's like a, a, a five-factor punch list that they put in. Massachusetts really only meets two of those punch lists. So the question is, is if there was a challenge here in Massachusetts, would that stand up? Our sense in talking to the Department of Revenue that, is that it would, and if it wouldn't, then it would be a matter of just changing the regulation to meet those five factors. So one of the factors is, for instance, uh, South Carolina, South Carolina is, it's called what's a, it's what's called a streamlined state. So uh, nationally, uh, the effort to over, to deal with the online sales tax has been to get all, as many states as possible on the same tax, streamlined sales tax, what they tax, how they tax. So Massachusetts is, is certain you know, changes in our tax code versus other states. And one of them is, you know, for instance, if uh, clothing is taxable up to a certain, it's not taxable up to a certain extent, but then if it's a luxury item above that threshold, it is taxed. In other states, that's not the case. And Massachusetts won't touch that. So if, if, the, if the Supreme Court basically says, no, you need to be a streamlined state in order to kind of meet these five factors that we put down and said you can tax, Massachusetts might not hit that. New York's the same way. So it's there. Um, the DOR doesn't seem to be worried about it, but if there's ever a challenge, there's, there is some. And, and I'd say you, you also brought up a good point when you talked about reducing hours. I think you've seen in other areas, like Seattle did a study and it showed a major reduction in hours for, for minimum wage employees when, that, when it even only jumped to $13 an hour. Uh, so there, there is that. I've also heard, I think in any room we've gone to, certain businesses that said, well, I, was, I had 27 employees and I might have 24 now because I don't want to trigger the employer contribution. It's just, it's the, it's the way you have to do business as business owners. You have to do what's right for your business to keep going, to be solvent, to hire more people, or, or expand, or grow, or stay, stay afloat. I just want to make a comment here concerning what's going on with our business. I'm one of you. My business is just down the street. And the comment was made earlier about getting involved. The government is in this state, is in your business more than it ever has been. In the past, you've concentrated on training my employees, trying to buy better, trying to improve my facility or my, my offering, whatever it might be in your particular industry. But I got to tell you, I think that concentrating on your efforts to establish relationships with your legislature, staying on top of these items, communicating consistently with, yes, local legislators, but even maybe some guests or customers of yours so they have a greater understanding of what's going on. Because if we don't continue to work on this now, the point's been made, they're already looking at $20. Do you think they're just going to sit around for the next four or five years and say, you know, we kind of, we're in a pretty good spot. We're going to just kick back and relax. No, they are going to continue to work to try to create that by a thousand cuts and make it even more challenging. So uh, I've been around a couple of years. I know that they are in my business 10 times more than they were ever in and we need to be communicating, getting our message across consistently and not waiting for our local associations to do it. We have to do it. We have to tell our story. It was already mentioned earlier where a story was told at the meeting at Capitol Hill, um, and, uh, or at the, I guess it was State House Day, and that story resonated. A few other stories resonated, and that's what we have to continue to do. Yes. Yeah, in and gentlemen, and gentlemen, we, we, you know, I every time I get something from Ram or whatever, I am one of those that I will send out. There's always the you know the email addresses and whatnot, and I can tell you, in the last six or seven messages that I have put out, I have only one time received one acknowledgement, and um, from one of the state representatives. Now. You know, I've been in business prior to my retail store for a lot of years, and I, I can spell. And I actually have somebody go through and make sure that things are grammatically correct, succinct, and concise. But I'm hoping that, I mean, is there any way? Can any of you help us? Because this is something we should be looking at going forward. How, I mean, if they're not responding, how do we write a letter? What are the, you know, what are the points that they would like to hear? Well, vote them out, I totally agree with. However, that doesn't make a nice letter. Hey, you, I'm going to vote you out. Um, Maybe it yeah, does. But it does. That is what they need to hear. Mm -hmm. Maybe it does. Yeah. 
maybe that is what they need to hear. Maybe, maybe I don't know, but if it, it needs to be a little bit more aggressive. I think the other thing you, you, you can do is, you know, employers is, you can only charge so much for a product, you can right. only do so much yeah. before, you know, it, it, it has an impact on your bottom line. But, you know, talk to other people in the community, let them know how these things are coming. Because they see the signs out there and they see the catchphrase and they see something quick in passing and they think, oh, well, you know, it's good for all businesses. It's, you know, it's good for the, you know, one business, it's good for all. And they, they tend to you start agreeing with these one size fits all meetings. But I think this one's going to have a little bit of an interesting effect because I think you're going to see a lot of workers see money coming out of their paycheck. And, it, you know, some of them may not utilize the benefit. Some of them may not want the benefit. And yet, once again, we're, we're putting something on all workers. But our and, clients are going to see prices rising, too. Yeah. I mean, if there's no way in to In Massachusetts, not, right. Yeah, to, that that point, to that point, be ready. Predicting, not guaranteeing, but the, what this is going to do to our industry, and I'm going to assume everybody goes out to eat at some point in time, you'll see menu inflation. But then there will also be, predicting, a surcharge to your guest check. And so you're going to pay more for the burger. You're going like to pay Europe. 14 or $15 for the 12 or $11 burger. But then you're going to also see a $3 surcharge Isn't that what labor. they do in Europe, though, Pat? Like, when you look at the check, that's why people in Europe are less likely to, because they tip. get a higher tip wage. So when you look at it, you see, like, the surcharge. But that's not the tip. That's... Correct. The so the just bring it to the next step. So menu inflation, um, then you have that charge that's on there. And then as a guest, you look at that and say, well, wait a minute, they're already taking money out that's going towards labor. Do I need to tip as much? So who gets hurt in the long run? It's that server, if you will, would possibly play a, pay a very dear price. So just to bring out a number, based on what we've seen now for the raise in tip wage, where it's going to go, and minimum wage. That, if that were to happen tomorrow, that would cost a local restaurant that I know very well over two hundred thousand dollars annually. Two hundred thousand dollars. Try to put that. Where where do you find that? Am I right? That's a lot of cornbread. Is right. Yeah. It just it's not going to happen without a dear price to be paid and the consumer is gonna end up paying that price. But anyway, all that being said, back to the point, what we have, what we are facing now is very costly. We need to be thinking outside the box and working together on coming up with a approach that we can all survive. I think that's it though, communicating that message to the end consumer. You know, you can only go to the state rep so many times. Like she said, after a while, they're, not gonna, they're gonna stop paying attention. But if Francine's customers are going to them saying, I can't pay eighty dollars for someone to come and walk my dog for ten minutes. Just, it's not going to work, you know. Because again, it just it trickles up the line. If they know that, and then they can go to the to the state reps as a consumer and a non-business owner, talking about I can't pay eighteen dollars for a cheeseburger. I can't pay one hundred and fifty dollars for someone to come and walk my dog. It, we can go down the line to every single business. That's the message they're going to start having to pay attention to. So, kind of, how can we get together as business owners or people that represent business owners? to get that message to the end consumer and maybe spend some money to do it, newsletter, whatever it may be, and get that point across more so than we are. Because if you've seen anything like on um, Facebook, like you know those the pages like Andover Moms and, and North Andover Moms, for example, that um, a, a few people have made the mistake of putting on there, do you realize what this is going to do? We're going to have to let, you should see the pushback from the average person on the street. They know you make a million dollars. You can afford it. You cough it up. Somebody making only to, oh my God, it gets yeah, visible too. That yeah, we are all the enemy. So that was going to be my point. You, you can, to some extent, you can educate. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily put a sign that says, you know, we're against fifteen dollar minimum wage. Um, we've seen. Uh, we had a member that went down to D.C. for a, a signing to allow for some relief on health insurance. He happened to end up in the background of a picture. Um, oh, with God, the president, God. and now he has one. He has to close down one of his stores because he was receiving death threats. The town put a boycott on, and he, he can't he can't handle that. I mean, his, his employees didn't want to come to work for him anymore. So you have to be very cautious about how you how you pose it. But I think you're right. I think it has to be communicated to your members. You know, if if, 
if you have somebody that comes in and says, you know, well, why is this price going up? You would explain it to them, say, I, you know, this is what the government's doing to me, and this would have to push back. But even if you go in and tell these these legislators, have these legislators say, I can't pay fifty dollars for a burger, they're true believers. They're going to come back. This we have a we have a very progressive legislature. They're going to push back and say, well, would you pay eighteen dollars if a if a mom could stay home with her sick kid? And that, and everybody's going to say yes. They right. just don't understand that how what it costs you to do that. Right. So I mean that's what you're up against. So, but again, uh, to your point on, on the the blanket um, kind of letters or, or emails are great, and you know it's it's certainly um, you know better than what most of our members will do for us. But it has to be a letter and then a follow up. Did you get my letter? Did you get my call? I've called three times. Why? You have to be a pain in their ass. Part of my language to get their attention, and then you need to have all the people that are doing the same thing, and they're eventually going to be like, I've had enough of this. And I think again that's what happened at this. At our, at our small business meeting, we had enough small business, um, small businesses, you know, in their face that they finally were like, all right, we need to do something. So yeah, the call to do the the grand bargain came that same week that we had small business day. It was yeah. almost an instant reaction. Um, so yeah, you're right, Ryan. You, you can stick your neck out so far, but you know it does come upon the legislators who have to <coughs> agree with you at some point and start to give away a little bit too. So well, one one more point, and then maybe we should yeah. switch back to clients questions is that one thing the chamber could do, which our my chamber does in South Shore, is bring in the legislature people to talk, bring in your local rep to have a meeting with the chamber and say, and this is one of the things you raised. Now you can't do it like a like a pitchfork and torch. You gotta be explaining them in a rational voice why this is an issue and why this is important. But that's a way to do it. But anyway, let's let's get back to compliance questions. And we're happy to stick around and answer yeah, any questions I afterwards, well. too, if you have anything you're not comfortable asking in front of me. And I have a, my business cards are over there, so if you want to email me afterwards, that's fine as well. Email me and we're passing around a sheet with all that information <clears throat> so that you can um, have it in front of you. And uh, just make sure to keep um, in touch with your chamber, following NFIB. You can follow us on Twitter at NFIB underscore MA. Retailers are on Twitter, too. Um, at Retailers MA, I believe. Um, the Restaurant Association, you can keep up with them too. We try to keep up to date information out there so that if there are any changes when the regulatory process does come up, uh, you know, we're getting information out to business owners as quickly as possible. And just to reinforce, and get involved with your state associations, whatever it might be. Um, you need to support them, they need your input, they need your support. It's a good plug, Pat. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so. Is there anything we can we can ask or require of the medical leave and family as far as proof to prevent abuses? Oh, okay. there, 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 is, there is proof. There is a proof <laughs> process that they have outlined. Sorry, that is. Okay. Yeah, but there will be something. Uh, I'll tell you. I was very nervous when the sick leave statute got passed on what the regs were going to be like. I actually was pleasantly surprised at the AG on how they did that. They did a very good job, and I'm assuming it's because they had very good push from the, from the lobbyists to get it done that way. So, but uh, but I think I'm hoping I'm hopeful that that'll be the same process here because I think employers do need guidance on that issue on when they can grant it, when they can't. And a lot of it will come down to you. they're going to send in the documentation to potentially this new bureaucracy that's being created. So, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, so we appreciate it. Yeah, and I wanted to just say thank you so much for sharing all of your expertise on this issue. Um, I appreciate everyone taking the time to come together. Honestly, it's great to see everyone in the room. I'm honestly surprised we weren't able to get more people when this affects every single employer in the country, or in the state, excuse me. So I commend you for taking the time. I appreciate it. I appreciate those who were able to come um, and can spread the word. We'll have the material um, passed out, as well as um, I'd like to say thanks again for all of our panelists. I appreciate your coming. And thanks for Roberta Israel and Weiner for sponsoring this breakfast so we could open it up to everyone, RAM, NFIB, Chamber of Commerce. And we'll just keep the conversation going. I do think it's very important. Knowledge is power. You don't want to get caught. You don't want to um, be blindsided by this. There's so many complex issues. We can't summarize it in an email. You need to get involved. Get involved with your chamber. Get involved with your advocacy groups. And get educated because you know January will be here soon. Um, and I think our guests can stick around for more questions. We have contact information. Yes, Erin? And I will say, they, and I, this is what I had said up at that small business day. Every time I would speak out, they come back with bullies. 
So know that you really have to have your arsenal in line because every time that I would say something, including the debate that I just had, when I said I was against the, the paid leave, it turned, my opponent said to me, that means I'm allowing my employees to be sick all over my confections. This is what they do. We have to be able to fight them the same way that they're fighting us. And that is, these associations are always looking for members to speak out because it will resonate that we are the constituents, that our, that our customers are their constituents. They're the ones that have to speak out, and, but be prepared because they are bullies and they will do all sorts of nasty things, but that's the only way that we can really fight them. The bar thank is you. open. <laughs> yeah. um, well, thank you again for RCTV for allowing us to share this with other people. Um, we have contact information, and again, thank you all. I think we all learned a lot. There's a lot of information.